Hi everyone. Thanks for joining today's CloudMaker talk surrounding preparing for standards compliance reviews and audits with Azure Security Center. My name is Shannon Keen. I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. I work on the enterprise platforms and tools team. What I focus a lot of my time on is how to demystify the cloud so that enterprise admins can make use of the full I guess see of benefits related to Azure. So you can reach me on Twitter, LinkedIn. You can always email me as well. I'm fairly active. I've been in the cloud, I think almost full time, just about five years now. So it's been an interesting journey and I've got a lot of horror stories, good stories and uh, you know ways in which you can make this work for you. And hello, I'm Dwayne Natwick. I am a Microsoft MVP and the cloud, cloud training architect lead here at Opsgility. I am, as Shannon is, very active uh, within uh, the social within social media. So feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, as well as uh, you know I'm a Microsoft certified trainer and a regional lead for that program. So I help with uh, a lot of that. I have a lot of cloud experience, a lot of certifications around the Azure and Microsoft 365 environment, as well as some IT security uh, specific certifications as well. So as we continue on our journey around the uh, around security within Azure and Microsoft 365, uh, we've We've been talking the last few weeks around Azure Defender, Azure Security Center, and some of those uh, those capabilities around uh, around those services. And today we're going to talk about how it works, how how we utilize uh, those tools uh, within uh, Azure Security Center and Microsoft 365 and Compliance Manager to uh, to do uh, a level of standards compliance. So we're going to provide uh, I'll provide a quick overview of what we're talking about when we use the term compliance uh, we'll, and then we'll also go into compliance manager uh, what what tools there are for governance risk and compliance within uh, within the uh, Microsoft ecosystem and then we'll talk uh, we'll finish up talking a little bit about uh, setting security benchmarks uh, within your organization so let's just kind of set the stage here and talk about uh, what compliance is and give kind of an overview of when we're talking about compliance what we're uh, what we're talking about here so everybody i think seen has seen this uh this slide before in one way or another when talking about cloud and we're talking about responsibility and shared responsibility as we are going through and consuming different services within the cloud uh, i think we've talked about it in probably a couple of these talks uh particularly around how uh, how we have our responsibility and what we need to take responsibility for, depending on what services we are consuming. Uh, when we're talking about on-premises environments, obviously we're talking about environments that we have full ownership of as a consumer. We're built where we have uh, within our realm of responsibility, the four walls of the day of the physical data center, everything physical within that data center for storage, compute and networking. But then as we start to consume the cloud, we take some of that responsibility and we transfer that to uh, to Microsoft in this case or to whatever cloud provider we have chosen. Uh, and then we no longer are responsible for that physical infrastructure, the physical building, the, the location, the, uh, the heating, ventilation, cooling, the, uh, the internet, the, the uh, communication connections coming in, the power connections, all of those are uh, the responsibility upon Microsoft to uh, to maintain and to comply with you know certain redundancy requirements and things like that that they're going to provide to us for service level uh, availability that become their the service level agreements that they uh, that we sign our contracts on as the consumer. As we move across the different types of cloud services that we are now consuming, we have different responsibilities then in terms of security and how it shifts 
in terms of from a infrastructure as a service platform services and software as a service, which, uh, you know, when we're talking about software as a service, we're really thinking, you know, in the Microsoft realm, uh, Microsoft 365, Office 365, Dynamics, Power Platform, those are all software uh, SaaS based services, platform services. We're consuming now uh, the uh, all of the platform based and we're doing development like an app, a web app services or uh, if we're utilizing like Cosmos DB or SQL data uh, managed SQL databases within uh, the Azure environment, those are all those platform services. And we have different levels of responsibilities in there. Uh, we're no longer responsible for operating systems, but we do need to uh, need to think about some of the responsibility. And one of the, the areas where we start getting some crossover here is within platform services because we are looking at responsibilities Microsoft has a certain level of base controls around the networking and the applications and identity, but there's some as we've talked about in in some of the other talks, there are some other higher level uh, responsibilities that fall on us for maybe putting additional controls to comply with retention policies and uh, and uh, classification requirements that we have on our data in the environment and so so that's really where you know what we need to look at in terms of how we are governing and how we are complying is where we have control and that's uh, kind of the main thing around this talk you know we could talk a little bit more about this but keep keep in mind just the shared responsibility model and what you have control over within here and the most and where you have the most control and the most responsibility to maintain your compliances within an infrastructure as a service within the cloud uh, you know that's that's as flexible and as uh, as much overhead that you have uh, as you know as you would in an on-premises environment uh, with the exception of having the physical uh, in your responsibility and so when we think about that and that take that shared responsibility and think about compliance uh, we as organizations may have certain compliances. If we're a healthcare organization in the United States, we have HIPAA requirements. If we're in the UK or Europe, we have GDPR privacy requirements that we have to adhere to. Uh, most organizations, you know, internationally on a global level have uh, have potential ISO uh, requirements that they have to adhere to. Uh, if you're in the US government, we have Fed ramp, we have DOD requirements, we have NIST, uh, lots of, you know, depending on where you lie within the government and what you, what kind of business you do within the government, you may even as a, uh, as a private firm have to adhere to some of these requirements to do business with the government. And so when, so these compliances, if you are a, 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 a company trying to uh, adhere to these, and adhere to these at the physical infrastructure level. It become it. It's very hard to maintain all of the compliances that are required, and maintain how you uh, all those controls and the control requirements that need to get you that need to get you to pass those audits. What Microsoft has is these seventy plus compliance areas that they uh, that they. In their physical infrastructure already adhere to and already have information and audited infrastructures on in the physical area that can get you to a point of of starting your journey to complying to complying to these regulatory standards so uh, so one of the key benefits in potentially moving to the cloud is hey i'm selling an application to the u.s government uh, i've never done business with the u.s government before and now i have to be uh, be ITAR compliant. Uh, we can, you can build that application in the Azure environment on an Azure app services platform and at least have the start of your compliance uh, to ITAR because Microsoft's physical infrastructure adheres to ITAR. It will not just going into Azure is not going to get you there. Uh, as we go go and think back to the shared responsibility, there's certain responsibilities and controls that you're going to still have to put in place in terms of how that app is governed, but it gets you there and gets you a very good start. 
And Microsoft has their trust center then, uh, as I said, Microsoft's very transparent about what they have, you know, what they have done, what their controls are, and when they, what their audit, uh, what their audits are and have been on in their audit reports for these, uh, for these compliance uh, attestations. And you can find them very easily going to the Microsoft Trust Center and find and just going in and digging into the different compliance areas and you can drill down and get the documents that you need around the infrastructure as you build your your requirements and your documentation that's needed for your audit. So as we think about compliance engineering, uh, and we've talked as we talked about a little bit, we have our standards, we have our customer requirements, we have the Azure compliance, and then we have our certification. So you know we need to take the standards and what controls are in place, and we'll show this a little bit in Azure Security Center uh, when we get into the portal. Uh, we have those areas of compliance of those of what is required in terms of controls within the Azure environment that make those standards. And many of those, what those requirements are when we're going through Azure Security Center is really what our, our requirements are as the customer to put those controls in place. And Azure then gives you the ability and the services and the solutions to, uh, to get those controls activated and get those controls and, and audit those controls within your environment. So we can now, uh, we now have a workflow in place to meet our requirements and get our certification. And it's important once we comply once, we're not ultimately in compliance forever. Things change within our environments, things change within uh, the requirements of compliance. So you need to have a continuous, uh, a continuous approach and continuous workflow, essentially like uh, you know a life cycle, to how you are complying. You know you have your your analytics and you have your standards and business objectives, and and you need to now look at that and and manage your the best practices for risk management and what is required within your your organization for compliance in terms of business objectives and what is required in terms of industry and regulations. Uh, to maintain compliance and maintain that certification. And so we need to do continuous monitoring and continuous testing and continuous auditing within our environment. And Microsoft uh, within uh, Microsoft 365 as well as Azure provide you with tools to do that, to do those, uh, those self audits and to review recommendations and controls that may need to be put in place that have, you know, that have changed within uh, within these certain regulatory standards and benchmarks that you may have fallen out of compliance for. And so looking at this, you know, on a regular basis and maintaining your uh, your levels of compliance uh, is a continuous approach and a continuous life cycle that you should as an organization uh, have uh, a certain level of workflow and a framework in place in how that is handled. So let's talk a little bit about Compliance Manager uh, as we go through and start talking about what Microsoft has in place for you. Uh, Microsoft has a single pane of glass for you know all of many of these uh, attestations, these compliances, uh, and you can look and see from a standpoint right away when you go to Compliance Center what uh, what is in place for GDPR, for ISO 27001. Uh, for HIPAA, for NIST, and you can see where you stand in terms of uh, of your actions that and what those actions and controls you have put in place, where they get you in terms of compliance and give you a compliance score. Uh, generally, because Microsoft has all of these uh, all of these attestations in place. Uh, you're going to generally see Microsoft with a perfect score in these places, in the, in these areas, uh, when you go up. But you can drill down and can uh, select the Microsoft uh, Microsoft actions and view what those are. You can again find reports and download their 
uh, audit reports and have that all in place to show, hey, they meet all of their physical requirements and, and processes that are required for GDPR uh, within their infrastructure and within their responsibilities. And then you have where your responsibilities hit in terms of the assessment, and then you can go through and, and create that workflow to assign those to specific users and specific uh, and and to get specific controls in place and get documentation in place and increase your score and get your get closer to that 100% if not all the way to it. Some things to think about when we're thinking about compliance manager and using compliance manager, the recommendations should not be uh, interpreted as a guarantee of compliance. Uh, this is only a, you know, it's providing a level of recommendation. It's providing the controls that are within the Microsoft environment that show compliance. There may be certain things that are required for compliance that's outside of that in terms of process documentation and things like that that have nothing to do with your actual infrastructure. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, another key thing that I always tell people and I pointed it out before before when we're talking about shared responsibility and we're talking about Microsoft and their level of compliances within Azure and Microsoft 365 is just going into Azure and developing an app within Azure doesn't maintain does not guarantee you of compliance either. There's a lot, there's your shared responsibility piece in there. Um, the compliance manager gives you those tools to continue to perform those self assessments on yourself. So uh, helps those controls that you manage and you're responsible for the evaluation and validation of all the effectiveness of your environment. It's not Microsoft's responsibility to uh, to audit this information and to make sure you're compliant for that information. They're just providing you with a score that is telling you where you might lie in terms of your infrastructure and the compliance of that infrastructure uh, so that you can then determine what needs to be done and plan for that, plan for the proper, uh, the proper levels of controls that you require to be compliant within your organization. And some things around uh, compliance manager in uh, in specific uh, specifically, and we'll talk about you know compliance manager is one piece of the compliance uh, compliance solutions within uh, within Microsoft. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the Security Center a little bit more as well, and their compliance area also uh, for the Azure environment. But uh, keep in mind that you know uh, for Office 365, Microsoft. Uh, Azure and Microsoft Dynamics 365, uh, you know, Compliance Manager focuses mainly on these five areas uh, that, and there's some different compliances in, in other areas as well, but these are kind of the five that kind of pop up right away. Uh, they're, you know, they're probably the most, uh, you know, most widely used and most uh, popular. And if you pull, uh, you know, some of the requirements like around NIST 800-53, you can also uh, maintain certain levels of standards and regulatory standards around some other uh, services as well. But these are, you know, from a standpoint of of all of the cloud services, the the main ones that you'll probably come across most uh, most often. Uh, there's some other other ones that uh, for specific use cases and things that things of that nature, you might uh, you might you'll probably come across as well. But these are these are ones that come up. Uh, mo the most regularly. And I'm going to now pass it over to Shannon uh, to talk about a little bit more about governance, risk and compliance and some of the services sure. that how they fit in. Sure. So I think when you go through the process and try and organize yourself related to being compliant, there are other sides of compliance that kind of need to be grouped together, namely governance and risk. So the big takeaway for this section is it's going to be high level. It's, it's going to be sort of a compass that helps you realize the full value of Azure. So the key capabilities surround Azure Security Center, management groups, Azure policy and Azure blueprints. So Azure Security Center has a lot of regulatory compliance built in. So long as you pay for the Azure Defender, you get a lot of those PCI, ISO, uh, NIST type regulatory compliance recommendations, and they help you improve the secure score. 
Um, we've talked about the secure score. You get that for free, but if you want to apply it to a, a compliance standard, you need to pay for the Azure Defender. Now, there's also Azure Security Benchmarks, which is based on the CIS Security Benchmark. That helps. It may not be 100% what you're looking for, but think is think about Azure Security Center as the big tool here that helps you related to the full-blown security and compliance when your auditors come knocking, so to speak. You can think about management groups that, that can come in and help you with your environments so that everything from kind of that higher level than a subscription. So all subscriptions will manage or will be managed the same way. So you have your management groups factored into the mix there as well. So you've got consistency. Azure policy can help you related to an environment that's already been provisioned. So maybe you want to deploy some audit policies or some uh, initiative definitions to help you figure out what's been deployed, how can we remediate and correct. And then once you remediate and correct, you can use, then use Azure policy to sort of really, I guess, regulate what actually shows up in your environment so that everything is as secure as possible. Blueprints are the repeatable way in which you build out brand new environments. So think of Azure Policy and Azure Blueprints as hanging out together here. That site on the far right, it's a great governance site. What it does is it showcase, showcases all of kind of the best practices and groups everything together so that customers only have to go to one spot. Well, at least in this specific section, right? One spot to get a lot of really good governance info to help you guide and plan your security environment so that you can actually handle these regulatory compliance requirements within your organization. So in terms of the managed tenant and subscriptions, so you want to make sure that you've got a great way of managing your environments that are connected to production. You want to make sure that they adhere to all the policies, that they they don't have something that's insecure being deployed in the environment. You want to make sure visibility shows up throughout the whole entire organization so that everybody knows exactly how to handle subscriptions that are tied to production. And when I say tied to production, things using Express Route or a site to site VPN. So you want to make sure that these environments adhere to all this, the best practices. And the way in which to do that is to have central IT sort of manage it. Now, I know that's starting to become less and less of a trend. A lot of companies are empowering their business units to handle the management of subscriptions, and that's completely fine. Maybe there's a central way of managing that inside those business units as well. But the recommended pattern is to make sure that subscriptions are centrally managed and maintained. You want to make sure that your unmanaged and connected subscriptions are just kind of sort of removed from the environment or they go through an audit policy where you determine what steps need to be taken in order for that to actually adhere to the right security for the environment. Um, you can also think about independent and unmanaged subscriptions. So anything living in the Visual Studio world, a dev test subscription, those are still relevant and you do need a playground. You just need to make sure that those environments and that it's very, you know, much so communicated down to the folks that are handling those environments. There's no sensitive information that shows up there. It's all dummy based information while your developers are building something that will help your business units out related to a specific process or something of that sort. So the idea here is to make sure there's more control control in the subscriptions that are connected to production, that you have mitigated any sort of unmanaged and connected subscriptions. You either had them go through an audit process or you've removed that connection point. And then you also still enable innovation within the organization. You still need that, right? Otherwise, you're never going to, in theory, move forward. So you want to think about the responsible parties as well. So you want to designate the parties responsible for managing and maintaining your Azure stack. Um, consistency is the only way to alleviate any sort of automation problems or errors in terms of human configuration. You want to make sure you designate the groups and roles and make sure that it's very much so communicated across the organization because without it, you really lack that visibility and then you're never going to be as compliant as you could be when your auditors come and you go through an actual audit process. So some of the recommendations show up here on the right. Your network security groups, there'll be one specific group that will you know, maintain configurations on a firewall, virtual appliances, they'll handle the NSGs, et cetera. 
Um, you get your network management teams. Sometimes it's the same team. Sometimes it's a different team. These are the ones that handle enterprise-wide subnet allocation. A lot of times those two, the, the first two are kind of grouped together. You can kind of see why. When you think about patching and management and remediating vulnerabilities, you'll want to make sure that somebody on the compute team is handling endpoint security. So that's really crucial here because you want to make sure that when the auditors come and take a look at your patch management schedule that you're not sitting in a specific situation where your endpoints are vulnerable. Then you'll want to think about an incident and management and uh, monitoring response sort of team. So anybody that's handling ticket flow, you want to make sure you identify the SOC and they're the ones that handle any sort of alerts that get generated or, or triggered inside of Azure Security Center or Azure Active Director Identity Protection. Then you've got your policy management team. These are the ones that are more architecturally focused. They're the ones that are figuring out RBAC, figuring out Azure Security Center, um, you know, administration and in terms of the protection strategy, Azure policy to help govern resources. Those tend to fall in the architect side of things. So that's where those folks will probably sit. And then you'll have your identity security and standards team. They'll be the ones that handle uh, Azure Active Directory in terms of the replication of identities. Do you replicate the password hash sync? Do you just replicate the identities? Do you have single sign-on, any sort of federation, et cetera? Those are the teams that'll be involved on, on that front. When you think about segmentation, so you want to identify security segments that are needed for your organization in terms of risk management, right? So you want a clear and simple segmentation strategy. It'll enable everybody within the organization to understand and then support the environment, right? Without this sort of segmentation scenario or policy driven by the IT side of things, you might see yourself with vulnerabilities that have been left uh, unpatched or environments that aren't as secure as they could be. Maybe they've got a storage account that doesn't have a firewall enabled, things like that, right? Or somebody who's, who's over permissioned on an environment and they really shouldn't be because they're just a developer building out some sort of tool for, that's kind of a newer tool, so they shouldn't have owner rights to the subscription, right? You want to make sure that the, the segments here are are outlined because what that does, it actually really enables you to successfully pass those, those audits, right? So it enables operations, it'll contain the risk, it'll isolate everything that needs to be more secure from somebody that's going around and trying to build something so that they've got uh, a new business process handled, right? And then you want to make sure that everything's monitored as well. So you just, you just want to make sure all these things are, are factored in when you set the stage and you've got your environment sort of humming because your auditors will come at any point, right? And you want to make sure you can go through your audits without issues. And usually it's a lot of a, a people process, especially at this point. From the uh, management group perspective, so you know, you'll want to use the root management group for enterprise consistency. This will enable you to handle governance like policies, permissions, et cetera, that will be handled consistently across multiple subscriptions. And think of your root management group as kind of one level higher than your subscriptions. Um, so it'll help you out defining the policy, the enterprise permissions, resource tags, whether or not they're going to be required, and if they are required, what needs to actually be filled in. You can think about sovereignty strategy as well. So if you don't want somebody to go deploy something into a more sovereign region or you can't because of regulatory requirements, that's where you would handle um, all of those policies. They would sit in kind of that, that root management group and so you'd be able to handle the environment, right? So the, the top level management groups, you'll align the top level management groups with a, that segmentation strategy. Uh, this will provide uh, you know, a, a point for control and policy consistency within each segment. And then you know, create that single management group for each segment under the root management group, and then don't create any additional management groups, right? Um, the idea here is to limit the sprawl. You want to reduce the group depth because too much complexity really kind of brings us back to the ways of old, right? Where we've got an overly complex OU structure or GPOs or things of that sort, right? Azure's a lot more flat and we probably want to limit things to two levels if possible, maybe three, not more than three, just because of the fact that you don't want to add additional complexity as you try to make your environments more uniform so that they can go through an audit process without a lot of hassle. So in terms of the, the root management 
group usage. So you want to carefully select what items apply to the entire enterprise with that root management group. So you'll want to make sure there's a, a clear requirement that's uh, applied across every resource and you want to make sure that it's got some sort of low impact. You don't want to change something that has a high impact. So, you know, good candidates include, um, you know, regulatory requirements. So things like I don't want to have my environment in multiple regions. I want to have it in one region or things where your storage uh, has a firewall on it, the, the storage account, things like that. Those are the ways in which to handle the regulatory requirements because then what happens is everything that sits underneath the management groups will be uh, adhering to those those standards out the gate. Um, you know, you'll want to plan and test any sort of changes. So some of the ways that Microsoft recommends doing this is creating a test lab and then having a production pilot. So you've got two hops before you even hit production with your management group changes. And I always recommend it because of the fact that things consistently change. Management group scenarios are, are more interesting now than they've ever been before. So there might be new features you want to take a look at. So just make sure you've got the environments around that you can actually spin things up and not have any sort of massive impact to production. So then we have to start thinking about some of the top risk categories. So you want to make sure that your virtual machines are getting their security updates. You want to be able to apply those quickly, especially if it's a, a zero day vulnerability, right? There needs to be a process involved because when your auditors come and they want to see how this process works for you, you want to make sure this is documented and that you can actually showcase maybe logs in the environment or uh, a governance plan, right? I always feel like those are the things that your auditors care about. And then you want to think about your VMs related to the ones that have a public IP. So you want to mitigate that. You probably either want to do one of two things. Remove that public IP and then have hybrid connectivity so that everybody's accessing those VMs over a private IP address. Or you can think about leaning on Azure Security Center and just-in-time access if you want to keep those public IPs on so that somebody could go into the portal, request access, gain access to the VM either via RDP or SSH, and do whatever they need to do. And then that's all traceable and trackable. So obviously, if you've got the private IP, you're not getting the same level of tracking. But if you need a public IP and you need to go onto those VMs to handle something, maybe you're patching a server, you can actually showcase that to your auditors when they come in and they say, what's the, the process involved related to somebody getting into that environment? So just in time is another crucial piece here in terms of kind of that top risk category. Then there's the security incident notification. So you want to make sure that there's a security contact designated. And I've had folks who identify one individual. I've had folks who identify sort of a distribution group. That is really up to you. I think a lot of folks are moving away from one individual person because what if that person goes on vacation? So the better reality is probably to send it to that distribution group. This will enable security operations to respond to security threats and, and risks and remediate them as close to real time as the actual alert was triggered. So this is really something that you'll want to make sure you, you quickly identify and you can always build workflows out too. There's a lot of great integrations from some of these ITIL or ITSM type solutions like ServiceNow. You can build in certain components of this that trigger a ticket, right? And then you'll want to take a look at the online service terms for the security incident notification section. Um, I always recommend this, especially if you're starting to figure out what your security policy and posture is going to look like. Take a look at our documentation. We're very transparent on a, on a lot of fronts here without having to worry too much, right? Um, because we're, we want you to trust us, and the only way to trust a big vendor like Microsoft is to take a look at those documents. And so we provide that uh, pretty... I think all you need is just a regular corporate identity to log in, right? So that's kind of a cool reality. When you think about access reviews, so you'll want to regularly review privileges. You'll want to take a look at who has access to what, how many global administrators do you have, how many owners do you have. Owners is kind of a no-no. You want to probably keep them at the contributor level, and you want to make sure that the folks who have contributor rights are the folks that kind of have those higher level security um, I guess, components in terms of the on-prem infrastructure. There's ways in which to map it, and I think that's something just to factor in as you think about what happens when you move into the cloud. There's layers, right? There's other rules you can think about in terms of uh, giving somebody the right permissions, but you'll want to take a look at this regularly just to make sure that you don't, you haven't over 
provisioned the account or given somebody way too much access when they only really just need to go in and reset a user's password, right? Um, you can think about it manually. You can also add some automation into the mix here as well. So that's kind of a, a, a cool thing to factor in as you build up your security uh, posture because your auditors are going to love to see that, right? That you're going through this regularly and that you actually are taking a look at who has access to what. So your, your security posture improvement. So you'll want to take a look at that secure score. And remember that updates every 24 hours. You'll, you'll review that regularly and you'll make the changes. You'll want to mitigate those risks as quickly as possible just because of the fact that you want to reduce the, the attack space on a VM. You'll want to reduce the attack space on a potential storage account because storage does hit the, the public side of things. It's publicly accessible, right? You want to make sure everything's locked down. And these are some great ways to think about in improving your score, right? Going in, taking a look at your network, taking a look at who has access to what, do your um, global administrators have MFA turned on, things like that, right? That's what, what will show up in your secure score and you'll have the remediation steps to, to identify and correct. Then when you think about access for the security personnel, so you'll want to make sure that you provide security teams read-only access to Azure resources. I used to work with a lot of customers who uh, their security teams would a little at, at first kind of freak out about this, but the reality is they only care about being able to see the resources. So they want to be able to understand the visibility and they want to be able to assess and report on risk. So you'll want just to give them the right security readers role, either in the root management group or this, you'll want to segment the management group. Because remember, you can have a couple of different layers in the management group area. Um, you know, you want to give them security center access. So you want to provide access to Azure Security Center uh, to remediate risk in Azure. That'll allow the security teams to quickly identify and remediate risks. So you'll think about, you know, either giving them, um, you, you can give them read access, but I'd say your security teams probably should have full access to Azure Security Center because they can set and enforce policies. They can take actions. They can follow up with teams, right? There's a lot of great steps that show up in Azure Security Center that gets you more secure. And then your operational responsibilities. So you'll grant your security teams with direct operational responsibilities, right? And, and kind of the appropriate permissions to, to take either on the resources specifically or to work and follow up with the right teams. If the security team has operational responsibilities, you know, additional permissions probably are required. So it's, it's really up to you in terms of how you handle security and, and assignment of responsibility within your organization. Um, you know, you'll want to probably review the built in roles. You'll want to figure out should you think about a, a custom role for the specific team here that's going to be handling some of the security operations side of things um, just because of the fact that they're going to need access to things. Uh, maybe they don't need access to everything, but they need access to say Azure Security Center to be able to go in and take a look at the alerts being generated, how to fix, and then they'll be able to either work with the teams or open up a ticket or, I mean, there's a, you can kind of see here, the, the, the possibilities are endless. So when you think about compliance, you can use Compliance Manager to report uh, and track on the Azure compliance items. I'll show that, I don't have, a lot of data to show, but it's pretty straightforward how to dig in. And then you can think about Azure Blueprints. So Compliance Manager will showcase how it matches up to a, like a security benchmark, a regulatory benchmark. Blueprints will help you in terms of the repeatable deployments, brand new net new deployments, right? So you wanna make sure that the, the deployment is automated and that the environment is provisioned with the right security standards so that when the auditors come and they take a look at your environment, you've got multiple environments and everything adheres to the same set of standards. A quick question, Shannon, that um, sure. when I was doing a class this past weekend came up. Somebody said, aren't Azure blueprints being uh, being replaced by ARM templates? And my response was that they really work hand in hand. So Correct. what's your take? What's your take on that? I mean, really, ARM templates go into the blueprint and how Correct. you're building your, your blueprint, right? Yeah, I haven't heard that um, the blueprints are going away and blueprints are essentially RBAC permissions, policies, and ARM templates. So think of it as like a wrapper across all three. Um, and, and I haven't heard that it's going away. I haven't heard that it's being deprecated. If anything, it's going to be bolted on to. Maybe it evolves and changes at some point, but I haven't heard that it's going away. Yeah, that was that was my take as well. And I was the class I was teaching was the SC900, which is a brand new class. So sure. <laughs> so yeah. and, and blueprints keeps coming up actually more and more. I think more so than even ARM templates as kind of that framework as well. So I just thought we'd, I thought I'd mention it here as well. 
Yeah, and I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, we don't know how the engineering teams are eventually going to evolve the service, but I think there's enough feedback that they've been given from these large enterprises that blueprints are invaluable because Mm -hmm. you have sprawl, right? And the only way to control the sprawl is by way of tools like Azure Blueprints and Azure Policy. That's the only way you're going to have better control because you want your teams to be able to build whatever they want need to build, but you want them to build it within the right parameters. Like you want them to kind of follow a set of instructions, but without those instructions, you're, and I mean, people are people, right? We're going to go deploy whatever we can. <laughs> I can go deploy an M-series VM. I'm going to go deploy it, right? You probably want to control some of that. And the only ways to really do that are through Azure Policy and, and then uh, Blueprints. Yeah, and that's why I use the, you know, when, you, when somebody's building a house, you have a Blueprint that, all Correct. your contractors are following to deploy everything so it meets code and meets sta- meets requirements and complies. And that's really what blueprints are. And yeah. ARM is just another one of those tools to then build and deploy that that blueprint essentially so yeah it's kind of like a like like a hammer or something right like the right. actual tool to build the house right so yeah. that's what i think of it like i think that's a good good analogy yep thank you um so see so so benchmarks so you'll want to benchmark your organization security against external sources. You could use the cis benchmark which you get for free you could use any of the regulatory compliance components that maybe you and your firm go through. I'll showcase where all that exists here, but that's the only real way to compare what you've deployed to a benchmark. So you want to take a look at all of this and this will you know, help you track configuration and compare it to guidance um, like the CIS benchmark uh, or the NIST benchmark or the ISO benchmark or the HIPAA benchmark, right? So there's a lot of different benchmarks that Azure Security Center can help you with. So Azure policy, you know, you'll want to use that policy to enforce and monitor and audit what's been deployed. That'll ensure your compliance strategy is met before anybody goes and deploys something because there's a great way to lean on Azure policy just to deny certain things. And I'll tell you what your developer goes through that once or twice, they will they will fix things and they won't get the red text of death. So Azure policy is a great tool to enforce that compliance. So I think, um, you know, it's really one of those things you can't have compliance without Azure policy. The elevated security capabilities. So these are really, um, I tend to see these more with like financial service companies or maybe healthcare companies. They want to have their own dedicated hardware security modules. That is the thing. There's confidential computing as well inside of Azure. Um, These areas I don't spend a lot of time in, but they are possible as well as bring your own key scenarios. So these are sort of the elevated security capabilities. You'll evaluate it on a case by case instance based upon some sort of regulatory requirements. And the reason I mentioned financial services and healthcare, they've got interesting requirements that require them to go down these paths. And that's why Azure is starting to have a lot more customers embrace these kind of security, uh, these elevated security capabilities. So and then, you know, just the the general information here, you're going to want to monitor the active, the Azure Active Directory risk reports. You'll want to identify those risky sign in, the risky users, right? I'm normally in Chicago, but all of a sudden my account is trying to log in across the pond and say Europe or Russia or China or something, right? That's probably a hacker. You'll want to take a look at that as well as you'll you can go through penetration testing. I think a lot of folks forget that, you know, you still have that capacity inside of Azure. You're probably going to want to open up a ticket and just let Microsoft know what you're doing, but you still can highlight some of the areas in which um, that that they might be more insecure. So that's another way to validate your security defenses. And that's also a great report to hand to your auditors when they show up and they ask, what testing have you done? I think we're down. Yeah, we're back to security, yeah, security benchmarks. Yeah, let's talk about some security benchmarks and then we have some time. We'll go and take a look into Azure Security Center and Compliance Manager. Perfect. So as as Shannon went through, she covered a whole bunch of of uh, different tools and capable, you know, and and kind of those, you know, how to, uh, you know, areas and solutions within the Azure environment and all of these build into what we what we want to do in terms of security benchmarks and you know why are security benchmarks important uh you know really 
you know, what they do, just like we were saying with policies and uh, and blueprints and everything, it sets that foundation up for how we are going to baseline our, you know, what what is required for our organization. You know, we need to determine, okay, this these applications or our entire environment for for example, needs to be PCI compliant or needs to be HIPAA compliant. So we need to make sure that any resources that are being deployed within that uh, within that environment have that proper compliance. And that's where benchmarks and baselines come into play. Processes, you know, documentation, and then those tools that we have within uh, within Azure and Microsoft 365 for uh, for our benchmarks, utilizing uh, utilizing Azure Blueprints, utilizing Azure Policy, utilizing uh, Microsoft Graph APIs, all of those to provide us with security benchmarks. And Microsoft's provided uh, quite a few of these benchmarks in here, you know, as well, you know, within you know NIST standards and uh, and the CIS, the Center for Internet Security Standards, is kind of a foundational one that Microsoft goes by in terms of their security benchmarks. And like we've said, PCI, HIPAA, GDPR all fall into those as well. And then we have those capabilities then to take that and and what how it adheres to different uh, experiences for the customer is we create then that control framework. And here we have, you know, different, uh, you know, a documentation in terms of what those controls are and what those controls may look like and what controls we need to have uh, in terms of an assessment where we find those can where we find those particular issues and then we can then take uh, take those issues and we can as a customer you know if we're doing those for different customers or doing them for specific uh, specific areas if we're doing projects for customers we can have different uh, different uh, uh, assessment areas and assessment documents based on those particular areas. You know, if we have a particular resource group that has to adhere to a certain level of compliance for say it's in the UK and we need to have GDPR, we can do an assessment on that area. If we have another area in the United States that needs to, uh, that's government work that we need, uh, that we need NIST compliance, we can do that for healthcare work, HIPAA, et cetera. We can, we can bucket that a little bit as well for what controls we have in specific instances. And when we want to do, uh, to create those security benchmarks, what we're doing is ultimately creating some level of consistency and Azure provides us with those areas and we've talked about all the security benchmark documentation, you know, the compliance attestations that Microsoft already has in place that, you know, we can download audit reports on uh, the standardization, determining what we are going to standardize on as an organization so that we can then uh, and then maintain the, our compliance and maybe just look at a standard uh, cloud security benchmark uh, even just to get started. You know, you can turn on uh, sec you know, turn on uh, security baselines right when you start your t start your tenant and put all that and have all that in place uh, right away while you are beginning and uh, and and starting your cloud journey. And then you can then adjust accordingly based on your needs and then automate those benchmark capabilities utilizing those Azure blueprints and run books and all of those things and 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 monitoring then that compliance through Azure Security Center. And we'll I just talked about these already. I'm just going to skip through those so we can get into Azure Security Center and this this will kind of lead us into the actual demo of Azure Security Center, but really Azure Security Center provides a very clear cut and easy to uh, consume uh, dashboard around what levels of compliances you need to have within your organization and where where it falls. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this slide. I'll turn it over actually to you, Shannon. And if you want to uh, share your screen and kind of actually go in live and show what we're sure. what we're talking about here. So let me get the right screen. I always feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm almost going to pick the wrong thing. All right, so take a look at regulatory compliance. So 
This is the security benchmark that we've been talking about. It's based upon the CIS benchmark. Just like with everything else in Azure, you've got a readout inside each one of these sections. So this is the network security section. We've got identity management. It highlights exactly what's considered out of compliance. And then at the very top here, you may have seen the other ones, ISO 27001, PCI DSS 3.2.1, SOC TSP, and then ISO 27001, uh, that's the 2013 flavor, I believe is the way, the right way to, to talk about it. That was the update, I think, but keep me honest here, Dwayne, you know this a little bit better than I do. These are the different regulatory compliance features that are sort of baked into Azure Security Center. So let's say you wanted to take a look at the, the SOC compliance. Now remember, in order to see any of these, you need Azure Defender enabled. You get Azure Security Center or Azure Security Benchmark for free, which is kind of cool, but a lot of customers need the deeper levels here, and this will match it to specific sections of the regulatory compliance. So ensure shutdown system is set to administrators, right? So 25 out of 38 resources are configured incorrectly. Um, keep on going down here. Uh, let's see. These are all the kind of the customer responsibility pieces here. Uh, deny log on through remote desktop services is configured. You'll see it keeps trickling on through as well. So you can keep going through. It's going to be everything in the common criteria related to logical and physical access controls. It's organized in a pretty decent way here, but if you, you know, drilled into any of these, it would look just like what we showcased a handful of weeks back. Where you will see this and then you'll have to go to view affected machines. I, I believe, yeah, and then it populates the baseline in here. You can run the query and these are VMs in my world. So these are things that I'd have to fix to make sure that it matches the security baseline. So we'll go back to Security Center. So it shows you how interestingly coupled together the Log Analytics workspace is with Azure Security Center. Um, I wanted to go back here to the Azure Security Benchmark. I wanted to go down to there's a data protection. OK, so you see the quick fix, right? So let's go here. This should look fairly familiar. Remember, this is always built in for free. You've got your remediation steps. You've got your quick fix logic. So all that's going to be attached to your VMs if you go the quick fix route is that this little bit of JSON here is going to be tagged to that storage account. You can always manually remediate, right? This will showcase where it lives. I'm gonna make sure it opens up in the separate documentation. So you're never without the document on how to configure this. And a lot of the documentation goes into PowerShell, Azure CLI, and the template components you need to think about. But let's take the quick fix, right? Let's go down to things within my subscription. Let me go down to this one. You can tell I've got access to a lot of things. I thought I had, so I had my computer reboot today. This was tied to my specific subscription earlier in the day. So, or well, yesterday when I did all the, the, the testing to make sure this was all what I wanted it to show. So let's uh, let's click on fix. And so this action will prevent anonymous public access to blobs and containers on all Azure storage accounts. So we'll fix the two resources. And that's that quick fix component, right? And that's all tied into the Azure security benchmark pieces that are tied to the CIS benchmark. Uh, but you can go back here to Security Center as well. You can go to any one of these, you know, Azure Defender for Storage. There's a quick fix there as well. Shows the quick fix logic. If you wanted to grab this little bit of JSON and put it into an ARM template or a policy, um, these aren't even environments that I can see here. But again, 
it, it showcases what's deemed as healthy. And these are all I've got my Azure mask on. These are all deemed as healthy. And these are all deemed as unhealthy and I don't have access to these. So I won't be able to even click on them. But I, I think of this like a really great way to organize what needs to be fixed, right? And if it's something that needs to be fixed inside of the Azure Security Benchmark, great, ISO 27001. So these are, are really, uh, really awesome features. And again, these are the ones that, that require Azure Defender. So it's like the other demos we've gone through where you click around, um, you know, this one showcases storage account should have a private link connection. There's actually no no healthy resources within this definition. These are all labeled as unhealthy. And then you'll uh, click on this is like a diagnostic storage account. You'll get the remediation steps. This will take you to where it shows how to configure the storage account using a private endpoint. And then what this helps is it show it shows up in your secure score. So after the environment goes through an assessment period, your secure score will start to, to bump up. But you know, not really knowing certain things, like if you just were taking this out, out the box, you've never played around with this too much, it's really helpful in pinpointing what matters for each one of these regulatory um, com compliance benchmarks here. So I also wanted to showcase a little bit of Compliance Manager. So you know, it's here at the service trust.microsoft.com, WAC Compliance Manager. We could take the tour, I'm not gonna take the tour. Um, this is actually going to be changing. This is considered the classic version that will be removed from the trust portal in short order here. So you'll be transitioning to the compliance manager inside of the Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. And I believe that's for Azure as well. But um, as you saw in the screenshot within one of Dwayne's slides here, you've got the compliance score and you've got, so there's no customer managed actions for any of these. These are all Microsoft's actions, but you can go into these and you can figure out the Azure InScope cloud services. These are the Microsoft managed controls. You can see a little bit more. All right, these things are assessed by this third party independent auditor. And they'll manage it into or show show how it I guess reflects in terms of what you have in your environment. Um, I like this to have as a conversation piece with customers that are very security focused. I think a lot of uh, customers aren't as secure on prem as they would hope to be in the cloud. And this is another tool that helps you manage and kind of maintain that security posture. So it's an awesome thing to dig into. And right now it exists in the service trust portal. So yeah, so that's the, the compliance manager components as well as the regulatory compliance inside of Azure Security Center. All right, let's get my screen back here and. I just stopped sharing. So yeah, so we walked through the compliance overview talked a little bit about Compliance Manager. Uh, then we walked through the governance risk and compliance, kind of helped you build that, um, I guess sort of the, the compass within your environment. Without having a plan, it's hard to handle the audits that will come in from your auditors. And then talking through the security benchmarks that landed itself kind of into the demo, where to find it inside of Azure Security Center, as well as what the Compliance Manager looks like. So and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, attending this uh, CloudMaker talk on compliance and Azure Security Center and Compliance Manager. And uh, until next time, I can't remember what our topic is for next time, but uh, we're I think about halfway through this series now. Uh, I think we've I think we've covered Azure Security Center and Azure Defender uh, for the most part, but we have some other topics that we're going to. Uh, going to get to as part of the security series of, of CloudMaker talks. So I look forward to uh, uh, to the next one in a couple of weeks. Yep. I'm Dwayne Natwick. I'm Shannon Keen. All right. Thanks very much for attending. Thanks, Have a great everyone. Bye-bye.